Hi everyone. Um, yeah, um, it's really cool and exciting to be here. I graduated from Cambridge in 2012, so it's 10 years. And um, yeah, it's really just like having a wander around this morning. It's really like moving to see how much things have changed and like the kind of conversations I think that are happening today or like so far from even being something I could conceive of when I was at Cambridge. So it's just, yeah, thank you to you guys for organizing this because I'm like ecstatic that stuff like this is happening. Um, okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about four projects today, um, which kind of deal with non-normative ways of working in architecture in a number of different ways. So be that kind of non-normative ways of creating buildings. So maybe it's like more hands-on or, different ways of making drawings. Um, also kind of gray areas of pro bono work, so working for free and the kind of experimentation that can allow you to do. Um, and then kind of contrasting that against working in a much more traditional structure on the exhibition with the Barbican, which is obviously an institution and Bishopsgate Institute, um, but being able to create their a non-normative architecture in like more of a tectonic sense. Um, and before I crack on with that, um, I wanted to kind of touch briefly on these themes of identity and community that kind of run through these projects. Um, so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about how architects are kind of taught, I think, um, and maybe you will agree with this, um, from the time you're a student right through into the workplace, I think architects are kind of taught to over-identify with their profession. Um, and I think, you know, that creates this kind of toxic work culture in universities and the workplace. Um, and often architects are kind of only in community or primarily in community with other architects. Um, and what's crucial, I think, to all four of the projects I'm gonna talk about today is I guess I would describe myself not as an architect who happens to be queer, but first and foremost, a queer person and a bunch of other things who happens to be an architect. Um, yeah, so I think what's really integral to all of these projects is being someone who is genuinely in community with the people the project is for, that being kind of my primary community that I'm a part of. And um, yeah, kind of an explicit move away from architectural culture and architectural community and the kind of damage that it does um, and I guess how unwelcoming it is. Um, so yeah the first project I'm going to talk about is kind of how I got started doing this kind of work. Um, so this is the Feminist Library uh, relocation project um, which I got involved with at the very end of 2016. Um, after I graduated from my postgrad I was feeling kind of quite uh, what's the right word, disenfranchised and like cynical. Um, and I formed uh, a feminist design collective, which was kind of hard to get it going in the way I wanted it to, but it did lead to approaching the feminist library about this project. So this was their site that they lived in for 30 years in Waterloo. Um, and around that time, 2016, maybe a bit before, basically Solid Council wanted to sell the building to develop it and they were kicking them out. Um, so I approached them and kind of said, can we help you with this? And they said, yes, please. Um, and these are just a few shots of the Feminist Library's old place in Waterloo on the last day that they were in there. So you can see there's this like really beautiful kind of like community character to this space that like architects like simply cannot create you know it's a like this really lovely space that has kind of grown over time it's like messy and dirty and like it's a very like real place and um it felt like a really important thing to make sure that this new space wasn't kind of over designed and, and that it was a place that could kind of capture the spirit of the old premises but also kind of set up and apparatus to allow a new space like this to evolve. So there was a lot of kind of bumps in the road. It was a really like drawn out project. I'm really just like cutting to the chase. Eventually they got a new space from Solid Council. Um, and it was this old school hall in Peckham. Um, so 
but we were then really able to like actually crack on with the real work of making this space. So there was loads of recycled and like donated shelving. There was the stuff that parents like we used to have and other people gave things and libraries in London that were being shut down by the government, that kind of thing. So we took all of that shelving and we spent a weekend basically taping out the shape of this new school hall space and figuring out how we could kind of reuse this shelving, like making like a sort of real one-to-one -one model of the new space. And then mapping all of that out, cataloging the shelves and kind of making this kind of active drawing um, as we were doing it so that that could then be rebuilt in the new space. So the big idea with that project was pretty straightforward, you know, they had this kind of great basic kind of hall space. So the idea was to try and keep that as kind of open as possible, as flexible as possible, wrap the space in the collection. And then that kind of means that events that are taking place there can kind of cross pollinate with the collection itself. They have this amazing collection of periodicals and books. So when people come for whatever it is, a film screening, a book club, you know, they're able to pull things off the shelves, the collection and, you know, um, community events kind of merge together. And then in the center of that space, um, there's these kind of like mobile um, bookcases, um, which was just one of the things that was donated. Um, and yeah, so they allow you to kind of reshape the space and corner bits off or not. And yeah, so it's, it's the idea is keeping it as kind of flexible as possible. So this is all the shelving when it came back from the powder coaters. We got it all painted the same color to kind of give it a bit of a new lease of life. Some of it was in pretty bad shape. And this was the opening of the new library, which was about a week before the pandemic started. So it then spent about a year and a half, like empty and not being used. Um, but now, um, yeah, it's really thriving. Um, and I think the new space kind of gave it like a real lease of life, like a new lease of life. Um, I think the old space, you know, they were there for 30 years, which was amazing, but going there um, before the move, you could kind of tell that it felt a little bit stuck in the past. And I think this move has really allowed the library to like transform and become like um, a much more used resource um, that's used in a lot of ways that I don't think it was before. And I think a lot of people who maybe didn't feel that safe in the old space feel much more welcomed in this new one. So I kind of would end talking about that project with maybe a little bit of reflection on the limits of collective working, which is like a super kind of like utopian thing that we all think would be like super fun and like amazing. Um, but there are a lot of limits. So I think what I took from that like four year process was people have different things they wanna get out of or give to these kinds of like pro bono spare time community projects. And they also have kind of like different politics, different levels of political engagement, and it can be difficult sometimes. And it's also really hard to organize ownership of bits of work. So things either don't get done or one person built everything. And uh, I think from all the experiences I've had collective working and experiences my friends have had, it, I don't think anyone's really come up with a way to stop that happening just yet. Um, but I do have now an example of some really successful collective working. So this was the start of 2021. Um, um, myself and a group of other people from the union, UBW saw, um, kind of got together to uh, mobilize and kind of respond to the government's consultation uh, about gender desegregated toilets. So basically they were looking to manipulate the building regulations in such a way that it would didn't it didn't completely outlaw building like so-called gender neutral toilets but it was going to massively discourage anyone from ever wanting to do that so what we tried to do in literally two weeks of time was um try and like harness architects pre-existing concerns and reasons that they already like super loose and gender segregated uh, gender desegregated facilities you know like that they're cheaper that they save space all these things that architects already like so to kind of Make them aware that this was happening, get them up in arms about it, but also try and 
educate them a little bit about the reasons they should really care about it and um, maybe start conversations in offices that weren't happening. So in that two weeks, we managed to write these two pieces, get them published in Dazine and uh, the AJ. Um, we also put together a template letter that architects could send to kind of complain basically. Um, and a template email that people could send around to colleagues in their offices to try and encourage them to write in as well. Um, so sadly, these two articles did not single-handedly stop <laughs> the outcome of that consultation, but it was an extremely fulfilling experience in terms of kind of like um, collective working kind of anonymously towards like a shared political goal. Um, so you know, it kind of depends how you measure success. Um, so yeah, now onto the kind of two kind of meaty projects. Um, so um, the LGBTQ plus um, community center in London pop up, which opened in December last year. So I guess this is a good example of like being in community with people and like being a queer person first and an architect second. I got involved with this because my ex-girlfriend was a campaigner for uh, the new space. And whilst I was with her, I got in touch with Sarah, who's the director of the charity, basically saying, I am an architect, all the time I am nearly an architect. And uh, if you need any help with anything, let me know. So she got back in touch with me um, last October being like, yeah, we do need some help. We've got a space and we're opening in five weeks. So I was kind of like, great, this is so exciting. Um, and this is the little kind of program I put together literally like the hour after I got back from meeting with her and her telling me this news to kind of figure out if it was in any way feasible. Um, and, you know, I was working full time, so I could only work on this in the evenings and weekends. So it felt kind of impossible. Um, but nevertheless, I cracked on. <laughs> um, so yeah, getting into the space, doing kind of like a very DIY survey. This was the space that they had got hold of. So um, the shell of the space was a shop and you can see it's kind of covered in this aluminium slat wall, which is like a very typical, Kind of shop fitting um and the decision was made to kind of keep that um so it would have been really expensive and time consuming to remove it but i also i think i tend to approach a lot of projects like design projects um through i guess a gender non-conforming lens when it comes to kind of beauty and what's seen as like unnatural um and i think something like this like immediately strikes me as something that most people I work with in my day job would like hate and find disgusting and like really ugly and we've got to tear it off the wall. So I was like, let's definitely keep it. Um, and it's also like a kind of like an interesting thing to work with. You can get loads of like really cheap fittings for slat wall um, and you can kind of like endlessly customize a wall. And it's also, I guess, just like a really low waste solution, like, you know, maybe it's not the most beautiful thing in terms of like how we like normatively think about buildings, but I think it felt like a really nice opportunity to like challenge that and see where we could take this kind of like weird pre-existing like feature. So the main ambition for this new space was again, flexibility. So, the space needed to work for like a number of types of events and uses, but it also needed to be flexible in terms of like not feeling too fixed, not too designed, like really a place that the community could come into and feel like they could take complete ownership of, like ideally feeling like a place that an architect had like no hand in. <laughs> um, and yeah, so a place that felt like, you know, they can make changes to, they can make it completely their own. So not feeling too precious or pretentious, like not like, you know, hackney hipster cafe kind of vibe, but also like not so DIY that people aren't able to feel kind of like safe and cozy there. Like it doesn't want to feel like a squat basically. And there's nothing wrong with either of those <laughs> extremes, but um, they don't feel appropriate for this kind of space. And the kind of space that the team in particular were really looking 
to create, which is something that I think didn't really already exist um, in London. So um, it was really great. It was loads of like donated furniture from like lots of designer brands. Um, so I kind of drew all of that up, which kind of created this like kit of parts to work with and try and like arrange and like curate a bit, I guess. And yeah, the great thing about that is it was like a ready-made set of loose furniture, which is exactly what you want on a project like this. So nothing's built in. It was all quite lightweight. It can easily be moved around, picked up. And also because it was all donated, it like instantly created this sort of mishmash of like high-end furniture. So it didn't feel too composed. It didn't feel too kind of precious. It felt more like a sort of like big house where everyone's brought their own chair. So it like gave it this like ready-made feeling of like being a bit of a jumble. So with this like super limited like time scale, I kind of just thought about the space as like a kit of parts. It was like, okay. So at first I was like, oh, there's so many things we could do. And then I was like, actually, what's the bare minimum to like be able to open? So the main thing that they needed um, was, is the mouse? Yeah. Uh, this kind of little quiet um, separate space away from the kind of main space. Um, they needed an enclosed private room for outreach, HIV testing, like lots of just kind of like private uses um, and even things that they didn't know, like what might happen in the six months of the pop-up. So that was the main thing that I needed to basically design and get built somehow. And also obviously the kind of reception and cafe surgery. So um, even though it was a super tight time scale, I was really determined that the whole thing would be built entirely by LGBTQ plus individuals and that they would, we could give that opportunity for, for kind of queer people in construction to have this like paid work. Um, and I did manage to assemble that team. So right down to like the plumber and the electrician, they were definitely the hardest to find. Um, but yeah, everyone who was involved in the build um, was from the LGBTQ plus community. But what that did mean was uh, finding ways to build things that were within the capabilities of those who were available at such short notice. So for example, like I couldn't find a plasterer anywhere. So it wasn't gonna be made a plasterboard. There weren't gonna be like metal sections. Um, so it was kind of looking at this little space, like it's acoustic requirements. Like it needed to be as separate as possible acoustically from the rest of the space. It might have like private therapy sessions there, things like that. Also needs to take into account the experience of the build team. So the people who are available, like the main person who was free to make the space had built a shed before. So it was like, okay, that's what like you're familiar with. And also trying to make it reusable materials. Like throughout this, I was very aware that it was only gonna be open for six months, which is like another reason for like keeping the site wall, like trying to like limit the waste. So I ended up going with this route of using staggered timber studs to decouple the two sides of the wall. And then you weave acoustic roll in between, which reduces the sound transference. So there's the plan. Um, and so, yeah, the other, the other move was to kind of basically build this room as a completely separate entity. Um, so it's not like stitched onto the existing walls, um, which just massively simplified things, um, which was like another thing in terms of considering like where to place it, like, this might not strike you as like immediately like the best place to put a tiny room like that in this space, but it was the only place where we could kind of get proper like wheelchair access, daylight into the space. And also crucially, like I had like one layout, which was so much better, but it would have involved so much coordination between everyone who was on site. And it was just like, that it'll never happen. It'll never happen. So putting it here just kept it separate from everything else. Um, and also, yeah, so in that existing space, the soffit was like full of like a tangle of services. It's also like a really tall space. So it felt like a really bad move to bring those partitions all the way to the ceiling. So instead, just popped a little roof on it. So it basically became like a little building inside a building, which feels like a bit more fun and like a little bit more queer than like just putting two walls in as well. 
so yeah, as I mentioned, it was a completely queer built team. So everyone kind of got to have this experimental and kind of transformative experience of like an entirely queer construction site, um, which I think was really appreciated by the people who were involved, like a bunch of them actually kind of went off and formed like a little like construction collective of their own as a result of like working together on this project. Um, and I would also say like, even as an architect, like it felt genuinely like healing to work on this project. Um, where my gender presentation was irrelevant to how the people I was working with treated me. Like when I started my potential career, I did not look like this. <laughs> and I've really experienced like the way that I am treated and the respect that I'm given like has really warped as my gender presentation has changed, even though I've become older and much more experienced and much more qualified. Um, so yeah, it was like a really beautiful experience to work on that all together and, and to be able to kind of enjoy the things we like doing in a safe space. <clears throat> so yeah, that's the, the kind of finished blank canvas in January. It looks quite different now because it's like, it has really been bedded into and it's been great to see how much has changed. Like they've really like not held back in terms of like doing whatever they want to do with the space, which is fantastic. And I think also the fact that this kind of little room, you know, it isn't built to, the most amazing standard has actually like encouraged people to kind of like really like you know stick stuff up on it make changes to it like it really has been like lived in um and yeah so you can see on the right there that's a little picture of the cafe counter that my friend ruby made um, and a lot of elements of that were recycled from a counter that was donated from cop 26 that's a little shot of inside the finished quiet room. So it has like a polycarbonate, like um, tri wall window. To, so there is daylight coming in, but it's like through two layers. <coughs> and here, yeah, these are just a few shots of come, some of the things that have kind of been happening <coughs> uh, in the space over the last uh, like five or six months. And yeah great news is that they've had like an extension of the lease so they're open still um next saturday this is happening um organized by my friend aska who was here a few years ago um i will be there come along if you haven't been to the center before i think perfect opportunity and then the final project i'm going to talk about is the barbican exhibition um which is really kind of the project out of all of these where like it was most possible to like test like tectonic architectural like queer ideas. Um, so this project, if anyone's unfamiliar, Bishopsgate Institute um, is kind of like the biggest archive of LGBTQ plus like history in the UK. They like take everything. Steph Dickers, who's like the head curator there, is like an amazing person who like just has like the most switched on attitude towards this kind of stuff and like from the moment I started working on it it was like like a dream partnership it was like so wonderful to work with him um so yeah uh, yeah sorry I should also add the exhibition was of, like 40 moments from Bishopsgate so not 40 objects way more than 40 objects um but yeah so when I start to get like stuck into this project um, the first thing that struck me was I was like this seems like an extremely linear kind of space like very like A to B so this is the curve gallery at the Barbican um, and I kind of was a bit like how are we going to be able to kind of represent the complexities and contradictions and the unruliness of queer lives and identities in this like super linear space um, and also wanting to acknowledge like the fragmentary nature of archives and essentially just asking this question of like how could we allow overlapping shifting and unfixed narratives and meanings to unfurl in a space like this so that began with a kind of like appraisal of the curve itself in terms of like its potential like queer qualities so it's a very kind of unique space has a very unique portion and shape it's a leftover space it's quite odd and it's constantly arcing and hiding and revealing so anything you put in there 
but any collection kind of appears to extend without end. You can never really see the start, you can never really see the end at the same time. Um, and there's a real queerness to this idea of a process of like veiling and unveiling, of moving between states, of being seen, being hidden. And ultimately, like, I realized it's not very linear, actually. Like, it's a completely bent space. Like, if it is a line, it's completely bent. So that's pretty queer. <laughs> um, so yeah, it felt like there was the potential for unexpected connections to be made in a space which didn't have a neutral form, like it's not a white cube, and it really demands a response to this like weird form. So, so I've got like, I woke up with a cold this morning, which is definitely not COVID, so that's why I'm drinking so much water. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so my idea was basically to create an arrangement that completely did away with the possibility of a singular preconceived route through the exhibition. So I kind of like laid out this central kind of wiggling axis and then arranged everything along that. So all the furniture and a number of items are kind of placed along that line, which multiplies the possible routes through the space and also allows a lot of objects to be kind of viewed in the round or from the back in ways that you might not necessarily typically see them. And then what added to this was that we only had like three quarters of the gallery space. Like normally the curve, you start at one end and you do exit at the other end. But in this case, um, we kind of had this like stopping off point that could be seen as like the end, but I would rather see as like a halfway point. And this is where I chose to put this kind of salon hang of placards from the Museum of Transology. Um, kind of focusing on like Black Trans Lives Matter. So placing that uh, at this halfway point hopefully allowed then the visitor who has to travel back through the show to maybe make new connections, take a more meandering route back to the entrance and, and hopefully kind of like maybe reevaluate some of the things that they saw the first time around. And to kind of further disrupt a completely linear journey through the collection, um, there was this decision I took to place this like library reading area that was required. So that was gonna be a space with um, a collection of facsimile um, queer magazines from the week that Barbican opened. Um, so I decided to place that area directly at the center of the spending axis of the curve, directly inside the exhibition, not next to it or after it, like right inside it. And the idea therefore is that kind of like create a bit of a stopping off point for visitors and it disrupts the normal sort of procession through a show like the kind of museum fatigue like da, 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 this 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 um but also like create like a really messy noisy space right at the center of the exhibition where people will like linger start conversations with each other but still completely surrounded by the exhibition itself and the objects in it and this was a little bit and to be honest, like the exhibition in general or my approach to it was kind of drawing on the intimacy and connection that's made possible in hands-on domestic archive settings. So on the right is my personal favorite, um, the Lesbian History Archives in New York. Um, so yeah, drawing on those kind of um, domestic archive spaces where you feel like really relaxed and there is a different type of connection that you can kind of make when you feel that way. Um, yeah, so rather than setting the objects apart from events and community, this so this central space was also like where events were supposed to take place. They actually didn't take place during the end because the show was so popular <laughs> that there like, was not enough space and they had to do it somewhere else. Um, but the idea was that talks and workshops could take place in amongst the objects they reference and therefore members of the community coming to see the show would feel more a part of the narratives that they'd come to see and that their own stories could kind of sit adjacent to those told by the selected objects. Uh, another big element of designing this show was thinking about archives and how when things go into the archive, it can kind of feel a little bit like the life is taken out of them, like their story ends there, they become these kind of like precious, fragile artifacts that like mustn't be handled. Um, and Bishop's Gate is like already very kind of like on it with the response to that circumstance. So when they have their open days, and this is an example of that, they just like chuck stuff on tables, they let people get stuck in. 
And I really wanted to recapture some of that spirit in the Barbican, which is like a more sort of like buttoned up type of institution. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, so the idea was basically like trying to test as many ways as possible to get ephemera out from behind in a glass of frames and vitrines and let objects read the same air as visitors, let their community get their hands on things where possible. So every object that didn't require a vitrine found a home on the wall. So from A3 posters down to like teeny tiny event invitations and just like hung with bulldog clips, no glass, no frames. Uh, there was also like four sets of badges in the show and badges are something that feel like really like every day but also like super powerful and putting them in a case feels like like very wrong to me so I created these badge boards that basically set the badges back into a sort of fabric context um, keep them like relatively secure on the wall but allow people to like get up close and kind of like see them in a more real way <clears throat> um, also, when we were going through the objects um, at the very start of the kind of design process, we, there was a bunch of magazines that were going to be in the show that were just going to go in between, so like open on one page. And when we were all like sitting in the Bishop's Gate looking at like all these like great like gay mags, it was like people should be able to like read these and look through them. So we decided to make facsimiles of those magazines. <clears throat> And in order to kind of like keep them relatively secure, um, I designed this kind of like system that drew on um, like medieval chain libraries. Um, so they were just kind of held in place with these plastic chains, carabiner and some like little leather riveted tabs. And yeah, like I think people much prefer to be able to get stuck in like this rather than just looking at one page of a magazine behind some glass. Right out soon. Um, so there was also one more object that to think about with regard to this kind of question of like display. There was a big box of club flyers. So this was like a perfect opportunity to like recapture that spirit of Bishop's Gate Open Days, just get them all like chucked on a table in a completely like random order. This is what greeted you as you came into the exhibition. And so it was just this table that I designed had this like perspex, very thin perspex layer holding uh, the, the flyers in, space, in place. And then that was just secured with bungee cord, which was like held in this little routed groove. Um, all the cases in the show were recycled from past barbecue shows, went digging through their kind of storeroom and found all these like sort of like slim, like low cases. So I created a bunch of like bespoke new bases for those to all sit on and bring them all up to the same height. And what was interesting about this process in particular was it was a case of fitting the objects into pre-existing cases rather than what you typically do in exhibition design where you like carefully like put the things together that should go together or the curators told you should go together and then you like lovingly draw a, a case that will like perfectly fit those things. So what that meant is it was like lots of unexpected neighbors and cases and like surprising and kind of laissez-faire connections between things that just would never have happened otherwise. Um, and some ob objects had a lot of breathing room in their cases, others had much less. There was no like strict rule or pattern. It was kind of just, yeah, very just like letting things fall where they fit. And I particularly like this element of the exhibition because it felt to me like there was a really familiar queer sense of like lovingly altering and tailoring existing items to meet ends they were not originally signed for. I mean, I am standing here wearing an example of that today. <laughs> this is a shirt I took up myself. Um, and so, yeah, a, another huge theme in this show was queer domesticity. So most of the items were things from people's homes. So they felt at once kind of domestic and subversive every day and underground. So that kind of theme I tried to play with in a number of ways. One of which was like the way that curtains were used in different ways throughout the show. So curtains kind of have like an unpretentious familiarity to them. And the way that we kind of played with them is the curve is like a super tall space. The curtains were five meters long, so they were massive. <clears throat> and what I think made them 
like particularly charming is they were made uh, by a friend of mine and she made them like in her flat which was not like she, we only ever saw them like completely unfurled when they went up um, and they did have like a slightly like fuzzy homemade quality to them which actually just felt like a really exciting thing to put into a space like the curve gallery at the Barbican um, and like really the right kind of like finish to sit adjacent to these things that are yeah like domestic objects from people's homes um, so yeah it was uh, my friend Izzy who made those curtains but it was again an entirely LGBTQ plus team who made the stuff for this show so I had a lesbian joiner and uh, my friend Anna who I used to play football with as a graphic designer she did the graphic design and uh, my friend Izzy as I said made the curtains did all the kind of fabric seamstressing stuff. Um, another way this kind of thing of domesticity was played with was all the chairs for the event slash library space were secondhand kind of created this like kind of jungle of chairs where I guess hopefully anyone could kind of find a spot where they felt kind of like safe and cozy and um, yeah feeling like like a sort of familiar domestic kind of type of situation. <clears throat> and then all the furniture elements in the show went on to play with this theme. So they kind of like mixed and matched these three types of leg. So like a contemporary like Ikea caster leg, a traditional farmhouse turned leg, and then a 2D abstraction of that uh, farmhouse leg. So that was played within a number of ways in different pieces of furniture, um, kind of just like, yeah, upsetting familiar domestic furniture forms to like suit the project ends in different places. Um, and what was added to that was this spray painted pattern that kind of added like a sort of touch of like spontaneity to each of the pieces of furniture. Um, and you can see it here with the fire table where it has like the 2D legs and the 3D legs. And then this is an example that like takes it even further. This was like a bench that I designed um, where that 2D form is then like stretched across like the whole width of the bench. So finally, I just wanted to touch on like the overall material palette for the show. Like um, it was a two month process for the design and install. So it was like really fast paced. Um, so the palette had to evolve in quite like an agile way and was continuously being like added to. But I had this kind of like general instinct to create a kind of backdrop of blues, greens and browns. So yeah, something that felt like domestic and familiar but then that created a backdrop to like have these moments of extreme contrast popping sharply against it. Um, I also kind of like felt like this was sort of an amazing opportunity working on this project in terms of the fact that like the budget was very small, but the Barbican and Bishopsgate really trusted me. And it was about a couple of weeks in, I realized that I could basically do whatever I wanted. So <laughs> I was like, uh, Every queer exhibition I've been to in the past, like it tends to either have like a sort of like rainbow capitalism kind of theme, or it's like everything is pink. And like, I think a lot of people find that quite alienating. And I thought this was an opportunity to kind of create like a slightly butch palette, so I did. Um, so I kind of started with the fabrics. All the fabrics are from like normal fabric shops. They're not from like, um, like Chimera or like the places architects tend to go. Like they're just from like the Goldhawk Road in London. Um, so it started with like financing fabrics and then adding to that and building on it. Um, and I guess there was like a slightly polemic thing going on here as well. Um, like I have been working in architecture for like 10 years um, and like most offices I've worked in seem to like glorify this idea of like natural, neutral, honest materials. And it's something that I like find really problematic in a number of ways. Um, and it like asks a question of like materials are like neutral compared to what? And like where and why do you draw the line between the natural and unnatural? And how would that same thing can translate into readings of bodies and sexualities? So it was like this great opportunity to like make a palette that was like full of artifice, pattern, playfulness, contradiction, inconsistencies. Um, 
and yeah, just like, uh, yeah, create something that just really try to, I guess, it's like maximalism on a budget, basically. <laughs> um, so yeah, the show was like a um, runaway success in a way that I don't think anyone expected. They had 11,000 visitors in three weeks. So it was like queues out the door at the weekends. It was one in, one out, like a club. Um, it was like no show I've ever seen. And I, that sounds like I'm like patting myself on the back, but like it was, you know, down to like the successful, like, collaboration between the Barbican and Bishopsgate and myself. Um, and yeah, I guess the big idea and the big question for me um, from the beginning of like even being contacted to work on this project was whether it was possible to create a kind of true community space within an institutionalized setting. So everything I've worked on previously was like pro bono stuff that felt like real and like good <laughs> and like things that needed to be done and the Barbican like does not have like a perfect record when it comes to like a number of things um so I was interested to see like how it would turn out and I felt like I did the best I could to create an apparatus for a community space of some sort to be created um, and these are some of the bits of feedback that I personally cared the most about rather than like the reviews that were in the press. Um, so for me, like hearing these stories of like people going on dates there, meeting new people, getting each other's numbers, having intergenerational conversations, like lingering in that space, like whenever I went by, like it was always noisy and rammed with people and like people were like touching stuff that they weren't supposed to touch, like it was amazing. Um, so yeah, like all this kind of like feedback was so great to see. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to end on this image um, that someone from um, Twitter posted um, that I saw that I just felt like really captured the energy of what I was hoping would happen with this space. Like it's a complete mess. Like that chair is not supposed to be there at the end. Um, like, you know, people have been moving stuff around, like picking things up, like, and I think, yeah, just like using this gallery space in a way that, well, like I have been told <laughs> it, had, it had never really been used before or inhabited in that way before. So yeah, that's the image I wanted to end on because I think um, it really captures the spirit of that show. And I guess hopefully what I was trying to achieve in the other projects too.